welcome back to the channel. So, the shellac, my French polish shellac job is completed or has been completed. And I'm really, I don't know if you can see this or not, I'm really excited about it. I'll get it in the light, maybe that'll make it flash and shine. But it has that mirror finish that I was going for. I hope that's apparent. I was going for the, uh, the kind of, you know, shiny, shiny finish that you get with the poly of the fender. And obviously this deep red is going to have a very reflective quality, but I wanted it to have that that look. And it also matches up with the um, the headstock on the neck I got. So uh, it all made sense together. Uh, and the shellac looks great with this, but I'm really excited. I'm going to maybe bring it a little closer to see if you can see how good it looks. Look at that. That's fantastic. See the nice, beautiful sheen and shine? and uh, the light just sort of dances on it and uh, you really get like some dancing with the wood now like there's like the figuring it gives like a kind of a 3d quality and it just looks so nice you know it's really cool now if you're of the type that would prefer a more matte finish it's easily achieved so say you get it to this point, you've done a really nice French polish job and you're happy with what you have, but you think it's too shiny, you want to take it down, you know, you want to make it more of like the wood tone look, like this kind of flatter matte finish, or this uh, Gibson here. Uh, this is a Sonex 180. I'll do a video about it. Um, most people don't like these because they're made out of that resin, resin wood stuff, you know, it was like an experiment to make, oh boy, this thing is heavy. You can lift weights with this thing. Um, it was made in an attempt to do like a budget kind of strap pole, you know. Most people don't like it because they don't sound too good. Uh, I haven't played this one much, but I think it looks cool. But um, it had a matte finish, a matte factory finish. And that's kind of popular right now. I looked it up and the natural fender finish, the original one, is more like this kind of sheen, this level of gloss. Like my Squire here. But they also do a natural finish now that has more of this kind of matte kind of sheen to it, where there's still a gloss and a sheen, but it, it's not a deep gloss. It's more, you know, it's just a matte, a matte sheen, which is a different effect. Um, I wanted this because I've noticed that when you have this kind of matte sheen, like on this guitar here, whoever played it, it's all glossy down here. So like this whole space right here is rather glossy as if it's been oiled. And in the middle spot where his hand doesn't go, is still matte. So um, that's interesting how matte finishes kind of end up, oh, and it's really glossy over here for whatever reason, maybe because it sat <clears throat> in his lap, you know, as he played it at home. It's very glossy all through here too. The only really matte area is right here and uh, some of the back. <clears throat> so, excuse me. I wanted kind of like this glossy finish because I thought it would make the wood like dance and make like kind of a 3D effect, which is exactly what happened. It really showcases the wood nicely. Now, the other reason I was interested in shellac, the way I got into shellac was from uh, doing this neck here on the Squire. And uh, I, I was just looking for something that I could do to, I, I found this in a pawn shop, it had some damage, I wanted to just put some kind of finish on it because uh, the wood was, was bare where I had to sand it. Uh, because some kid like whacked on it and so I uh, had sanded it down and I wanted to find something I could I could just quickly do to just get the thing playing and I read about shellac and I saw it at the hardware store and I grabbed a can and in the afternoon I had a really cool finish and it was so easy now what I learned from doing this body and I don't know if it's wood or if this was just a very clean piece of well sanded maple that was very you know easy to work with Whereas this was a piece of wood that has been infected with uh, this bacteria or mineral, de mineral deposits. I think in the case of um, uh, Carina or uh, Limba, it's some sort of mineral. Uh, I'm not, I can't remember for sure, and it's like a bacteria, you know, it gets into the wood. As you can see, it just completely penetrates the wood. And you can see in some of the areas where there's a lot of it, that's where the little holes will occur. I'm, I'm assuming because it infects the wood and in some ways like softens the wood to the point where it compromises it and a hole forms, which is kind of what gives it, to, give it, gives it 
it's amazing character and it's just aesthetically so rich to look at it, it's that was important to me it was to have something complex that I felt was beautiful and that I felt like connected me with nature and that's another reason that I'm excited about shellac because essentially shellac is the secretions of a lac bug and a tree so you're looking at a bug in a tree, and I, I'm not sure about the secretions. You might want to Google that and find out which ones those are. But um, I'll let you, you know, find out about that. But it's bug stuff, and it uh, ages, and like the, the when it has like a more amber tone, those uh, flakes come from fossilized tree parts and things like that. So it's like this really, it has that going for it. You know, it's got the natural thing going for it. Uh, which I really like. And you could literally, if you mix shellac flakes, this is uh, uh, the Zinzo product, Bullseye Shellac, which is already pre-mixed with alcohol. But if you were to get the flakes, like on eBay or wherever you get the flakes, and if you were to mix it with Everclear, as opposed to denatured alcohol, you could literally consume it. You could eat it. It's the only finish that has been approved by the FDA for human consumption. You can paint your fingernails with it. It's completely non-toxic. The only thing that has some toxicity and some bad smells and you wouldn't want to consume it would be the denatured alcohol that people use to mix with it. But if you made flakes out of Everclear, you've made an edible product. And the scrapings of this, once the, once the alcohol evaporates, this guitar finish would be edible because the flaking wax would just, at that point, the alcohol has now evaporated or cured away, or dried away, and now we just have the, the remains of the wax and the uh, shellac itself. The other thing, so I started looking into shellac, you know, like what are the properties of shellac? I was interested in it because it was a easy finish for this neck, and I had read that Brad Paisley's Guitar Tech recommended it and thought it was really cool. And so when I saw that, I was like, well, that's a guy who's out on the road with somebody who's playing guitars heavily, so it must be pretty durable, it must be pretty reliable if a guy like that recommends it, because those guys don't usually do experimental boutique type things, they usually do things that were, are durable that will work. Kind of like the same reason why uh, Gibson used Nitro and, and Fender used Poly, it's a durable way to finish a guitar and less likelihood for people to bang it up and want to return it, you know, or it getting banged around at the guitar center hanging on the wall with a, you know, a fancy finish and it just gets whacked around. So anyway, people, that's why these companies use these really heavy-duty, hard-coated finishes. But I like to think of trying to find something natural that has a musical connection, too. So as I was reading about shellac, there wasn't much shellac how-to or information involving electric guitars. In fact, almost none besides this tech that I found, Brad Paisley's tech, that did a neck. And I don't think he's Brad Paisley's tech anymore because I, I continue to try to find information about him. And I found some information about Brad Paisley, and they mentioned a different guy. So he's probably moved on to someone else, but um, and gotten a different job, or who knows what's happened. But uh, he was the one who gave me, you know, inspired me, and he gave a recipe. It was in, uh, it might have been in Premier Guitar. I'll I'll put the link up. But anyway, that's what got me excited about it. I didn't know that it was edible. I didn't know it was bug secretion. I didn't know it was the covering that's on jelly beans, for example, that's typically shellac. Uh, it's been used in food products for years, and violin makers are heavily into this stuff, like heavily into this. So I thought it was like the simple, super easy way to do this. And what I discovered is from the neck, it was easy. On this guitar, not so easy. It was still easy in that I did not need a spray booth. I could do it right here in the house. Um, it is very easily fixable. Like if you make a mistake spraying with paint or or polyurethane, I'm assuming, I've never done much of it, but I, what I know about it is like if something goes wrong, you basically you gotta start over or whatever. With this, if you, have, if, you run into, if you encounter a dry spot, if you have a situation where the finish won't go on smoothly, if you mess something up, if it leans against something and makes a mark, that happened to me at one point, it leaned against a box and, and I didn't know it, and it made a line right here. So I essentially had to take it all the way down almost to the wood and build it back up, but it only took one day to do it. It, like, it was like four coats throughout the day, every two hours. You just And it was like specifically in this area, I built it back up. The next day, level sanded, it's like it never happened. 
And so if you can fix a mark that big, it was really deep, it was like a deep line. If you can fix a mark that deep, you can pretty much repair anything on here, you know, without any, it's going to be like three, uh, maybe two days you have to deal with it and then let it dry for a couple of days. Maybe for a week you're out of commission if you had a major thing you wanted to fix and then it would be back to normal, back to new because it's so easy to repair. But the reason I think that it's not in the electric guitar war, world, the reason you see it in the violin world uh, more is because maybe the instrument is smaller, maybe the instrument is not in environments where it's going to meet up with so many detrimental things to a finish. Uh, as rock and rollers, we're in bars a lot. Uh, we might be outside, you know. Uh, we might be impaired because we're high on something and we're smashing the guitar up or whatever. A violin player, on the other hand, might be at a recital, you know, and it's a very controlled atmosphere and nobody's smoking or drinking on the instrument or whatever, and the person playing it is in their right mind. A diff it's a completely different experience, you know, from rock and roll. <laughs> but anyway, uh, that, uh, I think, might be the reason why you don't see shellac uh, in electric guitars. But when you go into the violin world, it, shellac is chosen for its tonal qualities. Uh, you know, it's an acoustic instrument, so everything matters to the max. And in my opinion, where I'm starting to head, I know this gets controversial, but I think that to really, for me to, now this is only for me, not for anyone else. Everyone else has their own methods and their ears hear different things. But my ears now are pretty set on being really happy with the guitar acoustically at home. And that may seem weird if you're playing electric guitar, but I actually play these guitars and I compose on them quite often with no connection to any signal. I'm not listening to anything but the guitar itself. And that's just as inspiring to me as playing it through an amp. I, I really like to wait. I like to have this sound really good acoustically and feel great, you know, in my hands and be vibrating and resonating in a way that excites me. That's what inspires me to write stuff and that's what makes me excited about music. Other people have other reasons and they won't hear any of that stuff and they won't think that way. So that's not for them, that's for those of us who are interested in making this guitar, electric guitar, sound as good first acoustically before we plug it into anything and before I even get interested in electronics. That's why I got the most vague, like generic uh, Alnico 5. Uh, I, I mainly got this just because I wanted an 8-hole, 1-ply pickguard for aesthetic and another part of my sonic experiment with this being acoustic. I've already had a Strat with a 3-ply, so I wanted to see what it was like to have this you know, thinner, thinner version, and uh, I thought black looked great, and I liked the less holes, uh, the eight holes. I, I don't know why, I just think it looks cool. And uh, so I basically got this for the pick guard. The electronics aren't as important to me yet because I want to get the guitar right. Once I get the guitar acoustically really sound and playing great and not going out of tune and I'm not losing it when I use my trim, that's when I'll shift my focus to plugging it in, seeing what it sounds like, seeing how these sound, what it is I like about them, what it is I don't like about them, and that's when I'll start making my changes. But from my studies in the violin world, which I encourage you to do, they are looking at shellac and using shellac for sonic qualities because it is an uh, acoustic instrument. And they have, these people have very specific ways and methods of doing things, uh, which I found fascinating. They also have their own varnish mixes, which they will spend, you know, a lot of time on getting all of the different oils. Uh, there's walnut oil involved. Um, there's some, another one that I forget, I'm, I'm not remembering, but I'll try to put some of this stuff up. And a couple of links to a, I think it was a gear page thread that was very helpful on shellac. But uh, there's lots of different mixes of these varnishes. And some people use pure shellac. Most people use the flakes. Some people start with uh, de-waxed, then de-waxed. Some people use de-wax shellac from flakes mixed with alcohol to make a sealer base. So like they'll seal the guitar with the de-waxed de shellac and then they'll go over it with nitro or they'll go over it with true oil whatever their favorite finish is because shellac makes such an excellent sealer and it makes an amazing surface especially if it's de-waxed it'll make that amazing surface for whatever finish you want to put on so shellac would be useful to any DIYer 
if you were going to do another finish. I read a lot about people using true oils and things like that, and it's saying, I'm on my 20th coat, and it just doesn't feel like it's, a, you know, it's, like it's not building up. And the solution, apparently, never done it, so I don't know for sure. But one of the things that can really help is before you go on with the true oil, you do one coat or a couple of coats of sanded down of de-waxed shellac. So you use that as a sealer coat and it kind of fills up the wood and you know fills up the pores and everything if you haven't done a grain filler already. But it creates a nice even smooth surface that apparently other finishes really go on well to and really adhere well to. So that's the thing I've, I've heard. If you don't want to go shellac all the way, you do the Dewax shellac as a sealer base. And then you can put a, what it, your finish of your choice on top or paint over it. Uh, I'm seeing that a lot. Uh, the other thing that uh, I'm noticing is people talk about the French polishing and stuff. And the French polishing is a French style of applying shellac on furniture. And so I actually did that method. And also people talk about applicator pad, which many times is just a piece of a t-shirt or a rag. But I really liked what Stumac, uh, what John, uh, I mean, uh, sorry, Dan Erlewine did over at Stumac. He did a shellac finish for his daughter's little ukulele, which was a, uh, like a replica of his J45. And so he showed how to French polish it, and he has this really cool thing. If you've been watching mine, you know that I did it this way, where you take the little t-shirt uh, rag. I put three cotton balls in it sealed it up kind of around the cotton balls and then it's like a French polish where you're going in circular motion and right before it kind of dries that's the trick is you come up and you go straight. Uh, the trick with shellac though is especially if you've got it really heavy and you're trying to put on a really heavy coat it dries so quickly that if you get caught in the middle of these like circular things it just gets really sticky and it starts getting waxy right away. So it's easy to do it's really easy to put it on. If I did it, as you know, my experience level is very minimal. I'm just now breaking into this whole guitar thing, you know, trying to assemble guitars. And for me, I don't know what my end game is on it. It's more about I'm always just striving to get the best situation together to create the sounds I want to create. The best neck, the best body. I was really interested in white limba, I mean black limba, and limba in general, Karina. Uh, Karina is the Gibson name for it. It's just a marketing name. The real name is Limba Wood, black or white. Uh, this would be considered black Limba. So um, I'm, I wanted that wood because I was fascinated by it. Did a lot of reading about it. The history of Gibson uh, has a lot of information about this type of wood. It's scarcity, not so much because uh, it's uh, rare. I mean, it, that it's in on this uh, sites list or any of that kind of stuff. It's just because it's hard to work with, it's hard to find pieces that are uniform. So because of that, it never took off as it would that would be used, you know, in a large production type situation. But for me, it's the perfect thing because I'm making stuff, you know, like one at a time. So anyway, that's kind of what my thing is with it, is I'm just trying to get the ultimate sound to inspire me to make art. But I really like doing this and it was incredibly rewarding doing the finish. and the, I, I find the wood tone stain to be incredibly rewarding. So that's why I recommend people do it if you have any desire to do any of this kind of DIY stuff with your guitar where you kind of sculpt the tone, you know, and you get, you get the sound that you want out of it. Um, by kind of controlling the elements that the guitar is made, you know, constructed from. And even down to the finish. Because as I learned from these violin people, they chose shellac because, perhaps because it comes in nature connected to wood, comes out of a tree. It's part of a tree's essence, in other words. And so now you're mating it back up, you're covering wood on it, covering up a piece of wood, a natural finished wood that has no sealer. Now I've just got it basically covered up in a jelly bean coating. And I think that gives me a really good chance to getting a very pure tone that is not going to be dampened or damped by a thick finish, like a paint, a poly, a nitro, it's going to be open and alive because that finish is an open alive type of finish that's natural, very organic, over a piece of wood that hasn't even been sealed or anything. It's a very alive piece of wood with so much beauty, so much inner beauty 
I mean, it's incredible that what's coming out of this piece of wood. So I, I've been just completely dazzled by the shellac and how it operated. And I'll just quick, I know this is a long rambling video. I have a bad tendency of doing that. But I just find that the whole thing is more than just like steps. You know, like that's, I know people on YouTube do that all the time. You can go to any kind of subject or whatever and they're going to give you like in five minutes every little step and they're going to be very direct about it. I just don't think I operate that way, so I'll I just have to forgive me in advance. But I have a tendency to ramble. But it's mainly because I just I think that there is something about this process that shouldn't be ignored. It's not always about just the end result. The end result is incredibly important, but I think that this process uh, is very enchanting. As I, I've heard it um, in one of the threads, a guy said that he found the process to be enchanting. And I was like, you know, that really, that kind of hits the nail on the head. There's something about a natural thing. Like this came from the earth, you know, we're all from this earth, this piece of wood, this finish. There's something about that that I find fascinating in the same way that in other times of our history, people have found it fascinating to make things like these, these polymers and these chemicals. That was an incredible step forward, the durability factor and all that. But then, the, you know, sometimes when you get on that path, you can forget about the natural path and that there's things there that nature's already provided us with sealants and protectors and things that go well with wood. And the other thing, the last little thing I'll say about shellac and then I'll show you how I did the buffing process. I might even just make that a separate video since this turned into a ramble. So anyway, the main reason that I, I have enjoyed this so much is that it worked well, it was easy to do, but when you look into shellac as a technique, and a, the French polish technique as far as furniture goes. It's one of those things that it's easy to get into and start. It'll actually work and it'll look great. But I'm pretty sure that if like a French master, uh, you know, furniture maker dude saw this, he would say, oh, you did this wrong, you did that wrong, you know, uh, because I probably did it wrong. And it probably doesn't even look that great to one of those guys. It, it, uh, I've got it where I want it to be, but um, I can, bet you that the more you get into this French polishing stuff and the shellac thing, the more perfectionist it gets, the more you get down to like little subtle technique differences. Um, because like I said, I did the Dan Wine thing where I had the three cotton balls inside the rag and I would do the French polish and then finish on the up. Well, you, the main thing that I began to learn that's important to do is to start with really thin coats like do like a 50-50 mix of the sensor and you go on nice and thin so you can do that quick French polish get up and get out of there and it dries really fast as, it, as opposed to it being like a bunch of gloopy fingernail polish that's drying really quickly that you're trying to quickly like deal with this is more watery goes on nice and smooth so you do that for maybe a day maybe do it for two days depending on how well everything is taking the, the shellac. I had a hell of a time right here. This whole space right here was just one big huge dry spot. And I thought it was because there was so much of this stuff going on. And there was another one right here that has a lot of stuff going on. I thought maybe that was what it was. And it could be. That could be a big part of it because on one of the forums I read the guys were saying things like shellac doesn't, and any finish, does not like this kind of stuff as much as just straight wood, which is why guitar manufacturers don't want all this stuff going on for big runs, because it's less reliable, less predictable the way it'll behave as far as finish goes and sanding and blah blah blah. So, that could be part of it, but I also started thinking, this is where, this spot right here, like right down the middle, is where the two pieces join. And it might not have liked something about that, you know, who knows? Maybe it didn't like that there was glue, the presence of glue, even though you can't tell. I mean, it's so perfectly done. Toby did such a perfect job with it uh, that you, it's perfect. But maybe that's why. Like, maybe it didn't like the join spot, although it was fine back here. The problem I had back here was it bumped up against the box one day and I didn't realize it. And it put a line right here that I had completely take down to nothing and build back up again. It was easy to do. And I was so worried that I was going to have to try something besides shellac, try another finish because this was staying dry. But I just, I just stayed faithful to it, stayed patient, went slow, 
kept checking forums and realized that these kinds of problems come up all the time. And most of the time, the answer is that just give shellac time because it bonds with itself and adheres to itself. The drying, it actually does stuff when it dries. It doesn't actually cure the way like most finishes do, like the way this had to cure, the way a paint would have to cure, the way a lot of other like oil finishes have to cure, some of which would never fully cure. But shellac literally cures at the same time that it dries. And what I found is that most people recommend 48 hours. So we're at the 48 hours point. I'm past it now, actually. So I'm thinking about either, probably tomorrow, fully assembling the guitar. I'm going to wait maybe one more day just to give it 72 hours to not have something attached to it. Because, you know, once you attach it on there, if, it, if it's not ready for it, when I go to take it off, it'll kind of stick to it or leave like a big impression. And I just want to make sure that I've given the finish enough time to fully dry. But apparently it doesn't cure. Uh, it's not officially curing. It's just drying. Because with uh, shellac, the drying time is you're just waiting for the alcohol to evaporate. Once the alcohol is gone, shellac does what shellac does. It's a little different from curing. And I'm not quite sure about the terms, what, what the correct term is for that. Um, but those are just some things I learned about shellac. And I, as you can tell, I'm kind of an evangelist for it now. I really like it. And I like the fact that it's natural. I like the fact that it's easy for anyone to do it. You don't need a spray booth. But I will say that here's the distinction. It's an easy thing to do. It's probably an incredibly difficult thing to do correctly and to do great. So, like, I would say that this is, like, beautiful. Wabi-sabi, wonderful. I love it. It's perfect, but it has a little wabi-sabi. It's probably not just right. As I get better at this, continue to do these, because I've read about guys doing as many as like 14, 15 projects and still talking about being beginners as far as being good at the French polish technique. And every time you do it, you try something different or you forget the thing that worked before, blah, blah, blah. So there's lots of like sort of backward steps and sideways steps as opposed to just a line of progress. So anyway, um, I'm going to keep working on it. I think it looks fantastic, but I can bet you that if I knew a lot about finishing, I would know what I could do better next time. And as far as like flakes versus this stuff, I really think this bullseye is great, especially if your hardware store has like a can that's not like expired or whatever. Like this one has got plenty of time on it. Apparently that's a thing. Shellac expires. Once it's mixed, it has a very short shelf life. Obviously you can seal this back up so it lasts a long time in this. But if you have the flakes and you mix them, you basically have to use it real up, you know, within a day or it dries up and it's no good anymore. So, shellac. I think it's fantastic. I highly recommend it. I think my guitar turned out really well, and it just feels great. It's like you just you don't really want to put it down. It has this very uh, wonderful feeling. It just feels very just natural and smooth and glossy and wonderful. So um, it just continue. Things are just continuing to get better. Got to thank Toby Russell again for this beautiful guitar and this you know opportunity to make something beautiful. Uh, and it's been a great experience for me. It's kept me distracted from all the stuff that's going on. So I highly recommend it. The only thing I will say is if you're like me and you're a bit of a perfectionist slash like um, ADD type, you know, uh, I was having trouble being patient. But maybe that's what's good about doing these kinds of things. If you have difficulty with patience, uh, force yourself to do things that make you be patient and get that discipline. Uh, learn how to, you know, distract yourself from wanting to rush. So um, that's the only thing I'll say is that it kind of, I really realized that these, these projects really get into my head when I'm doing them, uh, which is good because it's better to have something like this in your head than something negative, right? Okay, so anyway, thanks friends. Have fun with your projects. Try out, get a little piece of wood, sand it down to 220 and mess around with some shellac and, and just start to envision some projects like you could do a neck in it or do a body if you're thinking about a finish and you want to do something a little different. Uh, durability was the one last thing I was going to say. Everywhere I look, people say, I, I don't know about the durability factor, blah, blah, blah. This guitar here, I put shellac on this neck, right? And uh, it's the one I told you about that I started with the shellac. And I, I played a house party down here in South Georgia, and it was like 100 degrees plus, you know, in this house because the air conditioner was down in this place. All these kids were in there. We were all packed in there. This is like last year. And I played a set, it was like a, probably a 30 minute set, it was a shortish, usually the house party sets are shorter. And it was super hot, and I'm sweating, 
and uh, the neck, I don't even think I wiped off the guitar. I mean, the guitar, it looked like I'd taken a bath. I would, and I don't, I'm not a super sweater, but it was so hot in there. I was, you know, it was just pouring. Uh, in fact, the little picture on the YouTube is from the little YouTube icon thing, you know. That's from that show. It was at a, high, uh, a house party, and it was the air conditioner was down. So anyway, if, if something was going to go wrong with shellac, as far as the finish wearing off or not being durable because of toxic sweat, you know, as people refer to it, it sure didn't bother it that day. And I went on to play several shows in 2019 and in 2018 with this guitar. And it's never had an issue. And I'm talking like gig bag, being tossed in a trunk, being tossed in a van. You know, not being babied at all in any way. Many times, you know, forgetting to wipe it down. Because you really, you don't have a lot of time to baby your stuff. Because you got to get off the stage, get all your stuff off as quickly as possible. The shows I play, I got to bust them. You know, I got to, I got to break them down myself and my band members. So we all just are going as fast as possible to get instruments on the stage get instruments off the stage as soon as our set is done. And we're very concerned about set times. If somebody tells us 30 minutes, we're done at 29 minutes and we're off the stage so that the next band gets an opportunity to get on stage. There's nothing worse than bands that stay on stage past their time. If you're doing that, stop doing that. So anyway, I digress. Shellac, I really love it. It is durable as it turns out. I, I've proven that. And we'll see what happens with this. This will be a good way to find out if it is very durable for a guitar body. Maybe a neck is, has a different thing that makes it easier to be durable. And this might wear in a different way because I'm touching it all the time. And I'm probably going to play it constantly. You know, so we'll see what happens. This will be a good way to find out if uh, my theory is going to hold true or not. Because I'm, I don't want to get stuck on stuff and like it and decide that it's better just because I like it, you know what I mean? So, I want to like it because it really is better and I want to think it's better because it actually is better, not just because I want it to be better. Thanks again.